Hello, squad. Today I'm talking to the redoubtable Stephen from the channel The Red Book, a channel that I'm sure most of this audience is familiar with. Uh, but if for some reason you're not, definitely take the opportunity to check him out. Stephen, hello. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on today and have a conversation. Do you want to kind of introduce yourself and let people know where they can find you and some of the stuff you've been working on recently? Yes, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. I'm Stephen from The Red Book and as Lexi said, people uh, who watch her content are probably aware of mine because I think we're quite similar in the types of uh, videos that we make. But um, I am a Tolkien-focused channel, it's, it's books only, and uh, I have a group of playlists that cover the, the Legendarium, that's kind of in-depth uh, analysis of the text, uh, Q&A videos, uh, my opinion on the Legendarium as a whole, responses to articles and uh, theories, uh, maybe covering the inconsistencies and how the text changed over time, so there's something for, for everyone if you're just new to Tolkien or you've read him for years, I hope that there's something everyone will enjoy on the channel, and uh, the, there's a link in the description if you've uh, if you want to check out the channel. I hope that you'll maybe watch some recent videos that will be relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, maybe of Numenor and Melkor worship that will be uh, and should be interesting, and uh, Melkor's fear of Varda, and of Melkor and the secret fire. So hopefully those links will be there for you to to check out yeah absolutely i will include all of those links along with the whatever relevant ones come up um mm -hmm. all of the various videos you've done on this topic which is morgoth today we are planning to do some discussion on him as a character um sort of his theological philosophical implications of what tolkien may or may not have been trying to do with him uh, at any given point definitely a topic I think we both have a little bit of an interest with or a fascination with. I know, like you said, you've had several videos looking at different facets of his yeah. history and his character, and I've done a couple recently myself. People are probably going to think that this is like a darkness-only channel. I promise I do wholesome things sometimes. But yes, it, definitely um, if you're looking for more on this topic and you haven't explored some of Steven's playlists that include this it's definitely worth checking out like you said this collaboration was probably a little bit inevitable i'm really used to seeing in the comment section or just online whenever i'm mentioned it seems like your channel is also mentioned kind of right behind or in the same breath or oh the red book did such a good video that you should watch on this it's like yes i've watched it i'm not i'm not <laughs> sending them over i promise no I, it's it's all good it's and it makes sense it's like you said we we both have our distinct takes on it but we both i think enjoyed uh jumping into the more obscure facets yeah. of the writings of the legendarium i think um, we're also um we're, we're both pretty fascinated with it's, it's not a coincidence that the the evil characters are the most interesting they're the ones that you can really discuss in depth so you know saruman Feanor, morgoth you know you could you could just make a channel about those characters so i think that's I only, I think I only plugged like three videos there, but I've probably got about eight or something so far that are just Morgoth because there's so much to to talk about beyond his basic backstory, you know? Yeah, Morgoth is kind of a lot. He's a little bit extra, I think. Um, <laughs> and that's why he's kind of, he's very fun to talk about. And I've noticed yeah. that those videos tend to draw a pretty significant audience in a pretty lively comment section. So I think it's it, maybe not just us, uh, maybe not everyone universally is as interested as uh, some of us are, but um, certainly it's, it's a significant subset of the fandom. Uh, so I will start by running down as quickly as I can, just um, as close to the canonical version of his history just to sort of give context and a little bit of background to anyone who's maybe less familiar with it or has understandably forgotten it in all the lists of all the many names and events and dates that you find yeah. in the Silmarillion. Um, and you let me know what, what I've left out. Um, so we have to go back to the time before time, the pre 
beginning of the world sort of celestial sphere. It's mostly, if you're referring to the Silmarillion, it's mostly narrated in the Ainu Lindale. So uh, Morgoth was not always called Morgoth. It, believe it or not, he was not at birth named Dark Foe of the World. He was a character known as Melkor, which roughly translates to he who arises in might. It's kind of the Quenya version of it. Uh, and he is one of the Ainur, the most probably the most powerful of the Ainur. And depending on what version or phase of the writings you're consulting, um, he's either most powerful but roughly equal to his kind of brother Manwe, or he's uh, many times more powerful than that. So it depends kind of on where where you fall on the timeline. But all all sources agree that he is. The most powerful, uh, the closest to closest in power to Eru of all the created beings. And during this time before the creation of the world and the beginning of time and the beginning of history, he's kind of he's goes through a little bit of an emo phase. He becomes a loner. He uh, looks upon the void and is impatient of its emptiness. He conceives thoughts unlike those of his brethren. Those are a couple of mangled quotes that kind of describe what's going on with him. And when Eru summons all the Ainur to participate in the singing of this great theme that he has, that Eru has conceived, the theme that's going to create the world and sort of set its parameters, uh, Melkor starts weaving in some of those original thoughts that are not really part of the plan. And it creates a great discord. It corrupts a lot of the other Ainur around him. They either stop singing or they can't sing right or they get messed up. And this is sort of the metaphor we have for why things are not quite the way they ought to be in the world. And Eru eventually manages through creating a couple successive themes to weave that discord, the discord of Melkor, back into the whole to create sort of a cohesive final unity out of it somehow. And that's going to be that's going to be important later on at several points. Just a bit. Just a bit. Um, so Melkor has created this discord. He's, you know, tried to basically wreck the world and has failed to do so. And now they're, I knew we're all kind of standing around looking down at Arda, which is the sphere, and they desire to enter into it. And uh, Melkor says, you know, oh, I'm very sorry that that didn't work out the way I thought it would. My bad, guys. And Eru says, yeah, right. Um, but he tells him anything. You're going to find out that anything you try to do you can't do anything that doesn't have its source in me. Melkor's like, well, yeah, watch me, Dad. So he, along with the rest of the Einar who will become the Valor and the Meyer, enter into Arda, so they become part of material reality. And Melkor plops down, looks around, and says, okay, this is mine, and we're going to organize it the way I want it. And his brother Manwe says, uh, no, we're not. That's dumb. We all have a stake in this just as much as you do. So uh, Melkor doesn't take that very well. He becomes the enemy of the Valar. Everything they try to do to sort of terraform Arda, he tries to mess it up whatever way he can. He gravitates towards extreme heat and cold. Those tend to be his uh, MO at first. So eventually the Valar retreat back. They create a continent, Valinor, and they retreat back to it. They fence themselves in. Morgoth, or not Morgoth yet, Melkor's wrecking havoc in the rest of Arda. Elves show up. Um, and again, I'm, I have to just rely on the Silmarillion here because canon is alive, but the Silmarillion is probably the closest thing we have. Um, so when elves show up, Melkor starts meddling and interfering with the elves, um, probably kidnapping some of them, probably involving them in some sort of orc breeding scheme. We're not exactly sure of the details. Tolkien prevaricates, uh, to no one's surprise. And this is the point where the Valar realize they can't just fence him out and leave him to his own devices anymore because now there are the children of Eru involved. So they make war upon Melkor, they beat him, which surprises him. Um, but he's spent he's spent so much of his power messing things up that he's not really personally able to draw upon a lot of it, control a lot of it anymore. Again, this will become important later, like like three ages later uh, when the rings show up. So they grab Melkor, chain him up, put him on trial. I'm sure it was a kangaroo court and sentence him to three ages is roughly probably roughly around three ages. We're not exactly sure. Again, time is weird. This is before the sun and the moon. Um, three ages of imprisonment in Mondos. When the three ages are up, he says again, look, I'm very sorry. Of course, he means none of it. He's lying. But the Valar really have no legal way of knowing that. So they let him out and, they, and he wanders around among the elves who are now have made it, the Eldar have made it over to Valinor. 
And he starts to spread misinformation and lies and dissent. And uh, eventually the Noldor in particular are all kind of at each other's throats. And the Valar are like, oh no, what has happened? And oh wait, it was Melkor. Surprise, surprise. So he scampers off. Uh, takes up with a spider, and Goliant comes back to Valinor in secret, sneaks in while everyone's kind of off at a party, kills the magical trees, he kills the king of the Noldor, Finway, he steals the gems, the Silmarils of Feanor, who is Finway's eldest son, the troublemaker, and Melkor, now named Morgoth, the black foe of the world, flees back to Middle-earth, and he kind of becomes like a classic Dark Lord, and the elves pursue him, and make war upon him. That's the bulk of the Silmarillion. I'm not going to try and summarize that at the end of it. He seems to have pretty well won, at least in Beleriand. And he's, you know, on his throne at this point. Can't really do anything personally anymore, but he's controlling a huge network of forces, different Maiar who serve him, Balrogs, orcs, whatever, what have you, men at this point. He's corrupted a good portion of men as well. Um, we have the Arendil story where finally someone takes one Silmaril they've managed to reclaim. They sail back to Valinor. They say to the Valar, okay, but seriously, though, help us out here. The Valar say, well, fine, I guess. Get up and go with all of the hosts of the Eldar and the Valar and the Maiar and basically everything they got. They go and pull Morgoth forcibly from Beleriand, which results in most of Beleriand being physically destroyed and sunk into the sea. Uh, they execute him and fling him into the void and shut him out forever. And there he remains, uh, consumed presumably by his ceaseless and unappeasable rage until, again, depending on what canon you're in, um, until the Dagger Daggeroth when he will presumably return and try again to take control of Arda and eventually probably be killed or defeated somehow by uh, some involvement of Turin. But that is that is a different story. And that's that's it. That's, uh, you know, that's his, I guess, his kind of history, which doesn't really seem all that interesting when you look at just what happens in it. Did I, what did you think? Did I leave anything important out? Did I miss anything? No. Who, who needs the Silmarillion when you can summarize it like that that's pretty much it it's it's a it's a constant uh fall for morgoth from the very beginning until he reaches that point where even though he's you know it seems like he's victorious some mistakes he's made in the past such as the fall of gondolin leads to his defeat with erendil surviving and pleading to the valar for for help and it's something that morgoth didn't foresee and that leads to his downfall so it's it's like a the, the more corruptive he gets the the closer he is to victory until the forces the forces of good are able to to oust him and then as we know his stain is still left in the world and you know Morgoth is still there well into the third age but even though he's beyond the um, physical constraints of the world his essence is still there which I'm sure we'll go into detail about but yeah, that's a good good summary. Cool. Yeah, that was the one thing I, I guess I didn't elaborate on, which probably with good reason, because it's something that um, is not necessarily obvious just based mm. on if you were just reading the Silmarillion alone. But yeah. um, it's, I think, crucial, especially if we're looking at um, the Lord of the Rings and the period immediately after the Lord of the Rings where Tolkien's trying to sort of square his third age, which he didn't really anticipate kind of, having to create at first he's trying to square that with what happens in the first stage and then kind of tie it all together and he refers a few times increasingly with you know sort of increasing confidence and insistence as he grows older and he tries harder to really uh, delve into the metaphysical considerations that Morgoth has disseminated his power into the material substances of Arda in a way that parallels what Sauron, for instance, would later do with the ring. You know, that line from the films about he into it, he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. And this is what allows the one ring to become so powerful. It's like this is what was necessary, in fact, to make the one ring the ruling ring was that Sauron imbue his sort of Ainurin essence juice into it. Uh, to the extent where if it is destroyed, he loses a good portion of that power and is as destroyed, I guess, as a, as a non-material sentient uh, spirit can be. Yeah, Tolkien um, 
that it's essential to understand this for um, understanding the motives of these figures. Like a lot of people will ask, why would Morgoth take a physical form if that physical form then lets him be defeated? And it's for Sauron and Morgoth, it's always related to their desire to dominate the physical world. They have to place themselves in it. And then as you say, when they release this power that they hold into a physical object in the world, be that the One Ring or the, the matter of Arda itself, that places them directly into it. And it's it's like, a, as Tolkien says in letters, it's the potential of their power. They're externalising it to take advantage of that power that they hold. So that's why it becomes enhanced. A lot of people get confused with that, where how can Sauron be more powerful if the One Ring contains the power that was already within him? But it's, it's externalised into the world, which is what he wants to dominate. It is kind of myth and magic we're talking about, but we have to understand all of that to really understand the motives of these figures, why they would risk defeat for the reward of greater power and control. But none of that's really explained in Lord of the Rings or the Silmarillion, and that's why, you know, maybe reading History of Middle-earth, especially Volume 10, is essential, in my opinion. Definitely Morgoth's, I mean, Volume 10 is Morgoth's ring. That's... Hmm that's the volume like that's the one um that is dedicated to tolkien turning these ideas and problems over in his head often in a very faux scholastic style so it doesn't necessarily make for a rousing narrative read but especially Mm. that kind of infamous now section at the end myths transformed where we have everything from world was always round and the stars and sun and moon predated the world and so you know we don't have any magic trees or if we do they're very different than what they were and orcs. So amongst all orcs of that, aren't elves, orcs, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, orcs aren't er- elves, except they are elves, except they aren't elves, except they might be elves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, amongst all of that, uh, sometimes quite frustrating material, we get some really juicy little snippets that I think, even if we consider them retcons, they weave really well into even the earliest. Maybe not the very earliest. Maybe not uh, Morgoth when he's more of a trickster type figure and he gets chased up a tree kind of a thing. Um, but once we get past like the Tevildo era, it works really well to explain, just as you said, those uh, questions of why, if he's so powerful, does he waste all of his power and expend so much power and become bound to a physical formula? Why doesn't he just like use his lightning force to blast them all out of the sky and then mm. it's like it's not a video game? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The answer so, is always control and domination. Just that's always the answer. It's he needs that control and he needs the ability to affect everyone and everything. Like he's he's treating the children of Iluvatar just like he would treat a a mountain. You know, it's like material that he wants to have absolute control over. So he doesn't discriminate between independent beings and the the matter of the world as well. That's the kind of level of corruption we're talking about here. Yeah, and for Tolkien, it's always domination. I just kind of spent some time looking at this, that you can come to that point from so many different angles. And uh, I think you just published a video on what if Sauron took the ring and what if Galadriel took the ring is another question. It's like these characters both in The Lord of the Rings tell you what would happen. They wouldn't be motivated necessarily by arrogance or pride or organization and efficiency which is kind of Sauron's uh downfall they would be motivated instead by pity and a desire to see justice done and Sam says to Galadriel something like you would you'd make some people suffer for what they've done and you would set things to right and she said yeah I would that's how it would begin but however you reach it once you get to that point where you're like nope you know what my will is the one that we need to pursue to the exclusion of all others and I'm going to make you do that whether you want to or not that's that's kind of the point of no return. That's where you start. You go from being misguided or deceived or under the influence of powerful emotions to being consciously evil. And from that point, I don't know that uh, we have many examples where uh, the character successfully changes course. I'm going through it. Now, they all kind of get um, an opportunity to do so. And again, in Morgoth's Ring, Tolkien's quite explicit that it's important to the narrative that they all be shown to have that moment where they're on the cusp of saying, you know what, maybe I was wrong. And then mm. they throw that away and just double down and become even more evil than they were before. But I don't think once you reach that point that Morgoth seems to reach early on where he decides, 
I have to take control and my control must be absolute. And I don't care if your desires or will or decision is different from mine because I'm just going to flatten you into compliance. There doesn't seem to be a lot of coming back from that. And it's, it's also related to the sheer amount of power. I know that word can mean a lot of things, but the, the power that Melkor was blessed with in the beginning, it's no coincidence that someone with that much potential is able to fall when he realizes how he can use and eventually squander that power. So we're talking about him having this opportunity to turn from that path, but he's already been told, you know, directly by God as well, that he's the mightiest of the Einar and he's not going to give up. If he keeps thinking that he can make things right according to his own will and he thinks his will is the greatest will, he's kind of leading himself into that corruption. It's pretty hard for him to get out of it. But Tolkien is still clear, like you say, about you know, they have the opportunity to return from it. It's important that they're always given that chance as well. We see that with um, even Saruman in Lord of the Rings. How many times does Saruman get told, you know, he's given that chance to turn from the path of evil? And every single time he's given it, he's, he seems to be more bitter about it. He's, it's just making him fall deeper into it. And that's uh, magnified to such a huge extent with someone like Melkor. It's all these people that are trying to turn him from that path aren't as great as him in his own mind. And what would they know? He's the one that knows the best. And that's exactly what happens with Sauron later as well. He has the greatest will, so his will should be the way. And it's, it's this kind of vicious cycle of corruption that just gets deeper and deeper. And that's, I think that's what makes him such an interesting character. He's not just a big evil dark lord. You can still pity Melkor in a way, despite how horribly evil he is throughout the whole story. And that's what makes him a great character. Yeah, I think the two aspects there of how very far he does fall, like you said, from the mightiest of the Ainur all the way down. And it's not a, it's not a flip of the switch either it's a process he you know starts with a misconception it turns into sort of a self-delusion his ego gets involved and it just cycles continually more and more diluted and more and more ruthless and then i mean it kind of culminates in the in the uh Narnachin Hurin, the Turin Turambar and uh, Neonor story. Of course, poor Belig, who deserved better, and I will keep saying it until I die. You can, I mean, it's just, you know, that's that's a, a special level of sadism to put someone through all of that, just the subtlety involved in making him, making his life so miserable and also kind of making it mostly be his own fault. It's just, it's spectacularly horrible. Um, it's it's hard love. Sorry. Yeah. Go no, go go on. It's like a it's like a real level of you know pettiness as well. Like if we're you no, know, we can't comprehend Melkor at the the beginning of time or pre time. It's meant to be, you know, Eru is uh, beyond our comprehension, but so would Melkor be, and he's like a fraction of what Eru is. Do you know what I mean? So it's like this Melkor, this being at the beginning, is um, so vast in scale and power. And he's like helping shape the universe, basically. And then suddenly, by the time you reach uh, Hurin and Turin, he's trying to spend his power working his will against one human family because they didn't bend to his will. And that's you know, unbelievably petty when you think of where Melkor came from in the beginning. You know, I, I, it's quite hard to imagine how he reacted just to someone arguing against him, not not believing his threats, that he would go to such lengths to um, punish them. It's just it's just one family in the race of men. It should be it should be beneath him if we're talking about the Melkor and not Morgoth the tyrant. So I just wanted to say how unbelievably petty that Morgoth becomes by that time of the story. It's he's like a different character compared to the mightiest of the Einar at the beginning of days. Yeah, it's like he and again, I, I think this kind of comes back to um, the self-delusion thing, the fact that he's built this persona for himself and this belief that if he just keeps trying hard enough, he can exercise absolute control uh, instead of, you know, letting go of, you know, accepting that maybe some he doesn't have to be in direct control of all things at all times. He could still, like you said, he could be, he's Melkor, you know, he can shape the fate of, he makes that boast, I am the shaper of the fates of Arda. He's probably right uh, at least in so far as 
having that tremendous power and that tremendous influence over, you know, not just material reality, but also linear time and history and shaping the environment that creates the Ambar. Um, just like Eru told him in the beginning, you don't actually have control over every, you know, anything. You kind of, you, you make a move, but you don't know how that move is going to play out. And he just cannot accept that. So he gets to this point where he just keeps telling himself, you know, yes, I can. I, I do have control over everything and I will prove it to you. And any this is the thing that Hurin tells me. He said, well, you know, I mean, eventually we're going to die and then you can't do anything with us. You know, at that point, your arguments don't hold water even under the most cursory observation. And Hurin is besting him in the argument, even though Hurin is, you know, a mere human man who's been beaten and captured and tortured and everything. And he's still defiant and, and making scoring points on him. And I think that's where we see Morgoth's pettiness come into play, where he's He's so fragile at that point that he can't accept any challenge to this narrative he's constructed where he is the master of Arda. Um, so that's, he tries to control everything and he doesn't. That's what I find. It's one of my favorite stories, the whole Children of Huron tale. And I, yeah. I've actually spoken to a few people about this before and we end up having different opinions. And I would, I would disagree with you on a point, but I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right here, but uh, you said that he's, he's probably right that he can control you know, fate in a way. But I actually agree with what you said later where you're saying it's um, when Hurin's defying him and he's saying, well, I can pursue you beyond the circles of the world. And I think Morgoth's either just completely lying about uh, the control he has over fate or he believes himself to have that power, but he doesn't. I think the whole, the whole idea behind the race of men and their no freedom from the music and their, their difference from elves, the gifts that Eru has given them is one reason why Morgoth fears them and hates them as well. You know, we know that uh, when Turin is in Doriath, he's it's said that he's free for the mo- for for the moment from the influence of Morgoth, but he still messes things up for himself. I think that's how I view the the curse. It's it's Morgoth puts this fear into them boasting about all this power he holds which is a power he cannot hold it's like above his station but the fact that he's boasted about it and he's told them this is going to affect you leads Turin into all the misery he basically curses them but spends his power trying to make sure the curse is fulfilled you know, that's where Glauron comes into it and the orcs come into it, this constant pursuit and making sure that everything goes wrong but it's really Turin that's making things go wrong as well, if that makes sense. I think it's yeah. so in a way it's as if the curse does work, but not the way that Morgoth thought it would work or boasted about it working. It's the curse works because he said it would work, but it's really the person he's cursed that's doing it to themselves. So can we then say that it did work? No, it's it's quite a it's quite interesting to think of it that way. So that's the only thing I would disagree with there, but no, I could be wrong about that as well. It's it's that's what makes that story so so interesting to me. There's so many different ways to read that part. Yeah, it's. I've done a couple dives in onto the whole question of Turin's mm. curse and what exactly elements uh, lead into it. And I think part of the reason that story is so resonant for people is because it's very intentionally so an extremely confused issue. I, on the one hand, you can point to bad things that happen to Turin that are obviously the direct effect of Morgoth's conscious pursuit then you have things that are clearly like Turin, you screwed up and made a terrible decision. Yeah. Like never trust a petty dwarf. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then there's like, there's a huge amount of material that's sort of in the middle where, well, you know, the world is hostile to Turin. That's probably because of the Morgoth element, but is Morgoth consciously drawing on that or not to, and I mm-hmm. think I, I agree that uh, so much of the curse, especially at the end is self-fulfilling. He's, It's like, you know, it's like Oedipus or a bunch of other, you know, myths on this topic where trying to avoid the prophecy is what turns out to make the prophecy come true. It's like this beautiful irony. But I wonder, and I don't, there's no answer to it, but I wonder to what degree Morgoth knew. And does he think that, yes, aha, my evil plan is working because I'm making Turin's life miserable with all of my orcs and my dragons. And this was part of my plan all along, even though parts that clearly no one could have predicted versus I'm going to show you her and I'm going to just let it be known that I've cursed your family and your son. And I know because I know men that they're going to shoot themselves in the foot essentially. 
But again, I, th- I think that you're fundamentally, that's a good distinction. I should have clarified when I said he's right in a way about being master of the fates of Arda, not in the sense that he has as much as he can try to dominate others through fear or physical power or whatever. He can't ultimately control or account for free will, specifically human free will, which is kind of this um, wild card that Eru throws in that seems to be tied to their ability to transcend Arda, again, typically upon death, which uh, humans aren't terribly thrilled about, but you know. Do you think that Melkor was aware of what Mandos or the messenger of Mandos had told the elves about them being unable to defeat a being like Melkor, even though he would later become so decrepit through the creation of Morgoth's ring? Do you think Melkor would be aware that he... um, the elves had been told that they couldn't defeat him and he maybe feared that because of the creation of Morgoth's ring all his power being placed into his devices and all this corruption that this time with an elf showing up at his door could have actually resulted in uh, his defeat do you think uh, that crossed his mind or do you think it was just the fear of being so directly challenged that made him not want to actually leave and fight him because by this time he knows that he's one of the incarnate he can actually be defeated he's he's like bound to this physical form now so if we're forgetting about fate for a moment Fingolfin could have defeated Morgoth you know if he stabbed him enough times with his sword he would have been defeated so um just what do you think Melkor was feeling at that moment I mean I think a big thing for Morgoth is that He went forth to the challenge, which he wouldn't have done, I don't think, at that point, unless he was overwhelmingly certain that worst case scenario, he could probably, you know, like uh, Sauron fries Gilgalad inside his armor when they're wrestling. So, you know, I know that Sauron's power scaling and all of that, but Morgoth still has uh, presumably the ability to cause a few volcanic eruptions and everything. So I, I think he's reasonably confident that he will survive the fight and defeat Fingolfin. I don't think he's sure of what that's going to cost him, and I think he fears the worst because, and I'm basing this off of, um, again, this is kind of mixing my different versions of the Silmarillion and the Ainulindale and everything, but but uh, heck, it's my channel, so I don't care. Um <laughs> I will mix cannons if I want. Sauron is a giant cat now. Um, this is a part of mistransformed, not quite motives. It's like section six, I think. Tolkien is making some tweaks to the story of that initial conflict between Melkor and the rest of the Valar. And the rest of the Valar, he emphasizes, kind of all have to come together, they think, to have a hope of personally confronting and overcoming Melkor, who at this point is still... Uh, much more powerful than he would later become when he's facing Fingolfin, but Manwe and Melkor uh, run into each other, and I think mm-hmm. it's I think it's um, Morgoth's ring, but it might be elaborated on in some of the Nature of Middle Earth material. They face each that other. That is Morgoth's and, ring. Yeah, that is Morgoth's ring. And okay, good. So I'm I've got the right source. They they look at each other, and he s- says that they're both um, shocked and kind of freaked out because. What they both see is that Melkor, who should be able to just, like, pin Manwe to the ground and give him a good wet willy in true older brother fashion, is not that powerful anymore personally because he spent so much of his power. And Melkor was not anticipating that that would be a side effect of his uh, shenanigans, um, that he would lose personal power as he disseminated it into Arda and into matter. And Manwe, having that more, I guess, sort of isolationist uh, stance has retained much of his. So they're both like, oh my gosh, like, bro, what happened to you? And Melkor's like, ah, I don't know, but it's not good, whatever it is. And Manway's like, yeah, no, it's not. I'm going to punch you now. <laughs> so Morgoth now knows that he's, you know, that there is a trade-off. Now he's aware of it because this is, you know, time has gone on. He's become, like you said, he's incarnate. Presumably he knows that he's incarnate. He's bound to that physical body. Um, And moreover, he loves that physical body. And this goes back to what you were talking about earlier. For him, it's all about domination. So even if he, you know, kind of pulls a, pulls a Sauron at the end of the second age and his physical form is destroyed and it's going to take him a long time to build one back up. But yeah, you know, you're, you still exist. You're still in the world. You can, you still have power disseminated that you'll be able to draw on. Like he may not really consider that fair, 
um, you know, like not not a fair exchange. So he's going forth and he's, you know, pretty, again, reasonably confident that he'll be able to defeat Fingolfin, but he doesn't know at what cost. And I think he's afraid because he's like, oh, shoot, I hope I have, you know, I hope I have enough mana or whatever it is left to <laughs> smite this guy like I should be able to. But I just don't know. And whatever, you know, he's probably going to stab me. It's probably going to hurt. And indeed, he cripples him for the rest of his existence if the Silmarillion is to believed and he gets scarred up by Thorondor on top of it. So, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's... Um, I think when I, when I recently made a Fingolfin video, I made a point that even though Fingolfin was defeated, it shows the world that Morgoth could be harmed. So despite Morgoth smashing Fingolfin to the ground, he's been defeated. It's a defeat for him because he limps back into his fortress. All of his servants have seen that he can be harmed. And uh, even though they still fear him and hate him and all of that, they've seen that he's not who he once was. And that, that that's another um, mistransformed uh, uh, part where... Tolkien says that it's not a coincidence that the greatest created power was to be Melkor. He was supposed to be far greater than the rest of the Valar combined. I know we're talking about different times here that things may have changed in the writing, but this does say he was far greater than them. He was to make, devise and begin. And Manwe, who was less great, was to improve, carry out and complete you know, the, the works of Melkor. But, like you say, when they meet, that power has been placed into the world, his personal power has been drained, and Tolkien makes this interesting distinction where he calls him, instead of it being Morgoth, that's the concentrated power of the being himself, it's now what he calls the Morgoth, that's the tyrant, the being that Manwe is standing in front of, and his agents, so that's all the Balrogs that he's given power to the orcs that he's corrupted and if you can defeat one the other can be harmed by it so the way to defeat Morgoth would be to unmake everything that he's put his power into and uh, I just thought that's quite a an interesting little section that doesn't really get brought up very often it's another another point about Morgoth's ring about the effects on him and how he in his own arrogance thought he would never be defeated but he's now allowed his own defeat through placing his power into the world, hoping that that would make him even more powerful. It's, it kind of has the opposite effect. It makes him less personally potent, but also more, I guess... Controllable, yeah. Well, controllable, but also he, um, you know, now it's really hard to get rid of him. It's like you said, he becomes the Morgoth. He's like a substance now almost. He's like an element. So uh, not really a he at all. He's just sort of this force, this, mm -hmm. the Morgoth, the darkness, the enemy, the inimical force. And it's so disseminated through Arda. It's very air and matter and, and earth, such that this is, again, one of, one of Tolkien's versions of this. This is why elves have to sail to Valinor or else physically fade into nothingness because they're nourished by mm. like, you know, food, physical Yeah, the earth. Yeah, yeah the earth uh, and they're, so their bodies become increasingly, I guess it's like mercury, it builds up in them the longer they live until they, you know, kind of lose their connection with their body because it becomes so imbued with that The body enemy. is of the earth as well, you know, it's the, the act of elves procreating they're 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 creating a, a child whose body is of arda and it's it's born with this morgoth element as you say to a lesser extent or greater extent being a part of the body so it's elves over time will be tempted by corruption or will be corrupted nonetheless so it's uh in a way morgoth kind of wins even though if he loses that control and uh, the control he desires he's still corrupted everything that the Valar attempted to make. That that paradise is impossible now because he's contained within everything. So he, he wins and he, he doesn't get to enjoy winning. So maybe that means he loses. Yeah, he can't ultimately be expunged fully, I guess, until, and again, this is kind of the, the big picture or end vision that Tolkien starts working toward or toward the end of his writing life. 
you would have to unmake the world and remake it again to make it without that element of corruption. And this is kind of, you know, a lot of people talk about how the Valar, they, they don't really do anything. We talk about like, oh yeah, Morgoth and the Noldor, and oh, they're so evil and they shouldn't have rebelled. It's like, oh, but the Valar aren't doing anything. They're just laying there and letting it all happen. They're like they're morally culpable for all of this. Well, when they finally are motivated to take action against Morgoth in the War of Wrath, they have to destroy an entire continent just to get to him and physically get him out of the world, get his his concentrated personality such that it still is and his physical form destroyed and out of the world. And that that doesn't even begin to touch on, they leave at least one Balrog behind. They totally missed the boat with Sauron. Men have already been permanently corrupted by whatever it was that happened back in the East. It's just, and the whole world is still just soaking in this nasty Morgoth juice. Um, so, like, this is getting it's getting kind of weird here, but it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's true. It's saturated with him. And, um, you know, even to get that partial victory, they have to wreck unimaginable physical destruction on the world. And they don't have the authority to really to do much more of that. Um, this is why, you know, again, with the Numenor thing, they lay down their governance of Arda and they say, well, I mean, honestly, the best thing to do at this point would be to destroy Numenor, but we don't have the authority to do that. So they have to appeal directly to, to Eru and ask for his direct intervention. That's kind of um, also to do with the lack of understanding of, of men. So it seems like when the first age ends, even though there's still plenty of elves, that they are really important in the second age men are starting to, starting to come into their own at that point and they're going to be more easily corrupted by this Morgoth element. But the Valar kind of understand elves and they don't really understand men. So as the world takes shape, Tolkien says, well, as it settles after taking shape, the Valar are supposed to step back and, you know, we're, we're blaming them for their lack of action, but they don't know if if they get involved, if they are actually working against the designs of Eru as well. So it's, um, I don't know what people are expecting. Like, like you say, when the host of the Valar attack Morgoth, Beleriand is ruined, and people just seem to forget that and say, well, why can't they, why can't they just do that again? And there's a lot because more Because it would kill everyone, well. and they, <laughs> that would make them as evil as, as Morgoth in their own way. And the there's also this idea of the designs of Eru, the men inheriting the world, and you're you're wanting men to be able to fight their own battles. And you know, as we say, the Middle Earth is is settling. Let men become the the stewards, and you have to give them some help because Sauron's such a piece of work, a powerful being. Yeah, and it's um, give them some help, which they do, but don't just send Tulkas in to punch down Baradur or anything like that. It's no one learns anything from that and it could just be more destruction. We don't know what would happen after if that had actually occurred. There's a lot, there's like a grand plan at work that no one seems to think of. It's just send in another army and wreck Middle Earth, which I don't think is part of the plan. And so much of that plan has to do with as time goes on, things seem to become more and more fixed, at least for the Valar and for the elves. You know, the Valar are also everything they do expend some of their power every physical effect that they have on the world is again it's just the same thing with morgoth it's just used in a more benign direction their exercise of direct power diminishes their sort of potential so they're getting to the point now where they don't really have much spare power to throw around and they, as time goes on for them they become weary and elves we already know for a bunch of reasons are going to become weary and more and more bound by their past decisions and more and more trammeled by fate and destiny and doom and all that. And men are the exception to that. I think that's kind of, that's why part of the plan is for men to take over because men, while they have more direct corruption from Morgoth, they also, you know, they're born, they enter the world, they have a sort of free relationship with fate and destiny. They can make choices that are unexpected and seemingly you know go against the tendency of the theme but actually of course are part of the theme all along and then once they hit a certain point then they die they their souls leave their physical bodies as is intended which is not the case for elves elves are meant to be inside their bodies for the whole time and if not then as close to it as possible um, but men are meant to leave and men are meant to go forth before they can be so fully i think absorbed in 
into Arda that they also lose that freedom. So I think that's, you know, maybe why um, they have to st step back and let men work because that's the unique power of men is to transcend that destiny and shape yeah. the theme in such a way that it will shoot Morgoth and the, everything Morgoth tries to do will rebound against him and become part of the theme because it generally because of what men do. Yeah, I think uh, well, I agree with all that. And it's, uh, it's also placing too, too much responsibility on the Valar as well, where they like we say, they're meant to use the, the power that they hold to shape the world based on that vision that they saw before the world was created. And, they're not meant to be gods, like lowercase g gods. They're not meant to dictate rules and say this should happen and that should happen. And they've made plenty of mistakes. They're they're not eru. They're 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 prone to mistakes. And you know we know that they want to learn from them. And even though if some evil occurs because of what they've done before, if they now step in to try and fix that evil directly, it might lead to something even worse it's like you say they're meant to they're meant to diminish as well and it's meant to be an inheritance for men and you can't just rely on the valar sitting in the blessed realm to do everything for you but we no one's saying they're perfect we know that they, they shouldn't have taken elves to to valinor they shouldn't have raised numenor right next to valinor and says since you can't come here you're not going to be tempted that shows a real lack of understanding of humanity to think that they wouldn't be tempted and people also forget that it seems to work in the end, even even if the Istari mostly fail, Gandalf doesn't fail with a little push from Eru, and uh, it still works out. So people are complaining about all this stuff when, in the end, men do inherit the world, and if we forget about the new shadow, it's meant to be a good thing. It's meant to be uh, the only race that seems to grow in potential as they go on is men, and we're now seeing the, the dawn of the age of men and the plan of the Valar worked. So who knows if, if they all just wandered over to Middle-earth, how catastrophic that would have been. Yeah, it's just, if things work out as they do at the end of The Lord of the Rings, why is anyone complaining about it in the first place? Yeah, I mean, you know, you read the Silmarillion and the whole Second Age thing and poor Kilibrimbor, and then, um, you know, Numenor is a horrible catastrophe, and then you know, Frodo at least has to go through a lot, so does Gandalf, yeah. but it all, it does succeed in the end, and... The other thing is all those errors that you named earlier, you know, the mistakes that the Valar made, even though they may have had good intentions and been acting in the best, you know, wisdom that they possessed, which is, again, it's finite. It's they're not they're not Eru. They're not the gods. They're not in control of everything, designedly so. The errors that they make tend to be interventionist ones. They should not have meddled with the elves. They should not have created a new home world for the faithful men. Um, you know, they should not have made an island and then tried to enhance men the same way they did elves. And I think, I forget exactly where, but Tolkien mentions a couple times that insofar as this was a, you know, a misjudgment, insofar as they are culpable, it's because these actions betray a lack of trust in Eru and in the plan. You know, they're looking at the situation and they're like, yeah, but it seems like if we don't do something, it's all going to go wrong. And I guess, you know, they're what they should have done in that situation, according to Tolkien and maybe according to Eru, has been like, huh, well, this seems really weird. Like, it's going to be interesting to see how this turns out to be a good thing after all. Um, but that's what they should have done. They should have, like Aule, you know, handed it back to to the theme and said, okay, you know, here's this element. It seems wrong to me, but, like, I obviously don't know enough to know what I'm doing. So let fate rule and let the story take its course and it'll... Presumably it'll all work out, and where they start to meddle is where you end up with things like Numenor and like the unrest of the Noldor. So having um, spoken about the Valar and if they are culpable and if they should have been opposing Morgoth more directly this whole time, let us circle back and look at a question which I still haven't quite settled my mind on. People talk about Eru in the Silmarillion and the Legendarium as if, oh, it's it's God, it's, it's Judeo-Christian God, it's just Tolkien standing for God. And that's obviously pretty close to true in a lot of ways, but I don't think it's entirely true. I don't think Tolkien, you know, meant for Eru to be a one-to-one -one correspondence perfectly with the actual god that he, you know, religiously would have been involved in a relationship with. Um, I don't think he's like, yes, and I put you in one of my books, O oh Lord. He's created sort of a, a, a comparable force and a comparable character to sort of provide some underpinnings here. 
but I don't think that Eru necessarily always works the same way as you could say theologically Tolkien would have believed God worked. Uh, we see this in, like, for example, the whole free will issue going back and forth on, well, does Eru know how it's going to end? Does he know everything? You know, how does this jive with, you know, how does how does the obvious existence of fate in Middle Earth jive with the obvious existence of radical free will in Middle Earth? It's like it's hard to say. Um, and of course, Tolkien was was pretty forthright with, I, I don't know how to resolve this issue, guys. You just got to go with it and, and see how it plays out. But there's this question of, as you said, Melkor was intended to be the beginner, the divisor. He's very hasty, so he has this tendency to start a new plan, get really fired up about it, pursue it really hard for about 30 seconds, and then be like, that's not working, bored now, and then run off and, you know, make a mountain explode or something. And then Manwes was supposed to apparently trail behind him and kind of more methodical and patient in temperament and be like, okay, well, this was a great idea. Let's see if we can finish it up, wrap it up here and move forward with that. And so we kind of have this intended cycle of Melkor, the theoretical good Melkor coming and shaking things up, and then Manwe kind of being the counterpoint to that kind of yin-yang sort of thing. But on the other hand, we know that Melkor, as you said, is the mightiest of the Ainur, and he knows it. Um, he's extremely creative, passionate. He goes out into the void. He's curious. He's investigating. Again, this is like all very early stage, relatively nice guy Melkor. He's super interested in, in the children of Eru that are supposed to be coming, even, you know, an interest that persists, even though it becomes... A malicious interest it persists into his latest stages so was it inevitable that melkor created as such a character was it inevitable that he would rebel to some extent and if so how much is melkor's rebellion how much of that was part of eru's original plan basically can we blame eru for any of this uh, and, and if not why and if so why uh, it's, it's, again, it's something that I still don't really understand, and I've been churning over. It seems much more complicated than the Valar issue, where it's like, well, of course they couldn't do anything, but the Eru issue is a, a tough one. As I think it's, um, I'm, I'm not going to have the answer. I think this is, uh, if, if I had the answer to a question like that, I'd probably be writing philosophy books about, about God. It's a really complex, people have been talking about that for centuries and centuries, but... No, we're trying to, if we're defining Eru as God, um, we're trying to understand the plan, just how much he knows. And if he knows everything, then what exactly is this plan? So um, the, way, the way I think of Eru, and I might be wrong here, I'm sure there'll be religious people wanting to quickly correct me about how I view him, but I see him, if he's outside of time, you know, the timeless halls, uh, I, I see it as being, if he's outside of time, he's outside of linear time. So right. he can see he can see all paths. And that's how I blend the this idea of Eru with free will. So it's maybe not that he knows that everyone, including Melkor, are, they're going to make the choices that they're going to make, but that he can see the results of all the choices. That's kind of how I've view Eru. He didn't make Melkor knowing that, well, this figure I'm going to make the mightiest is going to be the one that will rebel, and then I can bring elves and men into this theme, and, you know, just you know, planning it like that. I know every single thing that's going to happen. But when Melkor was created, he can see that, uh, he can see the results of the free choices that Melkor will make, because he exists outside of time. He's not seeing it happen as it happens. So that sounds very it sounds really strange to get your head around, but that's the only way I can really imagine a a being like Eru uh, existing while something like free will also exists. Because we're told that the the Ainur, you know, they have free will as well, and that must mean that Melkor had the choice to do everything he was going to do. But like you say, in his nature, being the mightiest, uh, apparently being the most imaginative and desiring to create is that inevitably going to lead to rebellion and that's 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 a question i can't i can't really answer but uh i can't really imagine that eru would know that everything was going to happen as it did but that he knew the end result of all the choices that everyone made and he can do that because he's god he's mm -hmm. he's meant to be beyond our 
uh, comprehension. So I don't know if any of that resonates with you at all, but it's uh, a really complex thing to wrap your head around. I'd, I'd rather, maybe Edu wasn't there and it was just the Valor, as easier to understand. But um, yeah, maybe this is a question for those who do believe in a, a, a God that exists while free will does exist. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what those people would, how they would um, reconcile this, but I don't know what yeah. you think about anything. There's a lot of different directions you can approach that problem from theologically. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd probably get just as many answers, you know, yep. as, as many different answers, and then as many people kind of throwing their hands up and saying, well, yeah, I mean, I, I have a religious framework, but I don't, I don't get this either. I don't know that there's been a conclusive <laughs> agreement yeah, are we, on are we that meant point. to get it you know it's yeah oh yeah for sure it's beyond beyond our understanding i like that idea though is he can you know good reminder that eru presumably is outside of his own creation that's kind of one of the big things is that he's not directly involved because he's created all this it's like you know if you're an artist and or a creator crafter of whatever kind you're knitting a sweater Yes, your thought is in the sweater and you've planned the sweater. The sweater is going according to your plan, but you are not the sweater and you could unravel parts of the sweater. You know, it's, it's kind of a strange metaphor, but anyone who creates anything knows that you are both you both are and are not your creation. You have to be separate from your creation to create it, even though it's all coming from you. But I like that idea. It reminds me of Leaf by Niggle where he's standing back and looking at the tree. And, you know, think about a tree. It branches. It's fractal. It goes and there's a split and then there's another split and then there's another split. And you, and for the first time, Niggle's standing back and looking and he sees the whole tree instead of getting hyper fixated on the one branch or the one leaf. And I think that's kind of the metaphor for the divine or Eru and view of the history of Arda is he's looking at it all seeing it as a single a single thing and seeing that it is good even though he's not necessarily looking at which branch branches off and where he knows that in the end it's going to make a tree and the tree is going to be awesome yeah, that's why I, he's seen to yeah. uh, just just a quick point um that's why he directly tells melkor you know that anything you're trying it's going to have its source in me and he's adopting well, a, a new theme using uh melkor's discord it, it just seems weird to me that if it if it was all planned that way, I think it, like you say, it's more he's looking at the bigger picture, and everything is going to be better despite the the evil that's getting sown into creation. But if I have to just ask though, if it was all planned out that exact way, why wouldn't he have just had the music of the Einar himself? He's putting himself into what would be creation, and that's what the the Einar are. They're all independent beings that have free will. So. If that was unnecessary, he would have just created himself. I mean, sang the music himself, but he doesn't. He creates beings to do it. So there has to be free will taking place. Otherwise, the whole exercise was would be pointless. That's how I would view that. It's clearly this is this is the way he's designed the world. He's created, like you said, he could have just sung the theme himself, snapped his fingers, and look, there's a there's a world, and it's everything's moving according to the way I planned it. Ta-da. But that's not really as interesting as, okay, well, let's introduce different wills. It's like, you know, if you're writing fiction, then you need to come up with characters. And Tolkien makes this parallel himself, I think, in, in letters, maybe. where and, and I know scattered throughout letters are different references. I think the most famous is Faramir, where he was not planning Faramir. Uh, Faramir just sort of appeared. Now, of course, Tolkien didn't actually believe that this character's platonic essential personality had invaded his mind and come out onto the page but on the other hand he realized that the creative process was happening so deeply in his subconscious that he you know really did kind of have to surrender to what his brain was throwing up and it seemed like it seemed like things were happening that he did not intend even though he knew you know that he ultimately was intending all of it and i think he kind of drew a parallel to that and and arda it's more fun if you can kind of delegate and introduce the concept of independent wills who are going to pursue their own agendas and seeing how that all plays out and the interactions between not only the wills and created reality, but the wills with each other uh, create something much more interesting than just kind yeah. of this mechanistic clock clockwork universe. That's actually, I was going to bring that up next. That's a really good point where you, you get, even in our world, 
creative ideas and imagination tend to come from you know, change and disparity. So that it kind of fuels this idea that maybe he did know that Melkor would cause conflict because these greater ideas uh, and themes come from the very fact that there there isn't complete harmony between all the the Einar. If there's disagreement, if there's discord, that's fueling some sort of creativity and that will lead to greater things. So like we say, if, if the, the end when the world remade, all the experiences of the previous world, everything's going to go into the shaping of this new world and this new music of the Einar, which is only possible through everything that happened before. And that would only happen if there was not complete harmony between all the people that were creating it. Maybe that lends kind of credence to this idea that Melkor was made so great to actually cause conflict between them. But I don't know how people who would believe in a god would view that, because that, that seems a little callous. But yeah, that's that's kind of a good idea to actually explain that he would know that Melkor would cause conflict, but it's all for a, a greater good. Yeah, and I, I think there's a distinction between he you know, likely knew, and again, we have to kind of imagine this omnipotent omniscient figure with our human brains so we're gonna have to like use some metaphors mm -hmm. here but if he creates melkor knowing that melkor is somehow going to cause to shake things up basically that doesn't necessarily mean because again melkor goes through stages you know mm -hmm. he goes from being like the slightly bad boy but he's still pretending to himself and this is even some early and he feigns to himself that he just wants to go and try to do better and try to fix what he what went wrong you know at least pretending to recognize that he's made some mistakes and going through the successive uh cycles like you talked about the cycles of corruption that just keep reinforcing themselves and reinforcing themselves until there's really nothing left of him and he's just this um nihilist force who, who not that he wants to control the world like sauron does not that he's setting out to start conflict he's not setting out to start everything he just is so frustrated that he wants to to just to wipe everything out and be the sole existing entity and he knows deep down he knows he can't and so he just is kind of just eaten up with spite and envy and and malice and he becomes like you said kind of pathetic pitiable in a way and even though he's done a tremendous amount of work corrupting the world and he can never fully be severed from the material of arda his personality and his personhood i guess has become diminished to the point of, you know, he's worse than Gollum. He's just kind of this muttering, crawling, hateful spirit. Um, worse, worse, worse maybe even than Saruman at the end of Lord of the Rings. I don't know how you could get worse than that, but it, yeah. presumably we have to believe that Morgoth at the end of <laughs> at the end of the first stage was. So yeah, you know, I think there's maybe a difference, like you said, between saying Melkor was created to bring that element of conflict and destruction um, there's a big difference between saying that and saying Melkor's decline and fall into Morgoth was inevitable and predestined and foreordained by Eru, and therefore Eru is the jerk here because he created this whole being just to cause himself and others suffering, and that's, you know, if you could have avoided that, then then you, I oh, yeah. think we can all that's... say that morally you would have an obligation to avoid that scenario mm -hmm. if you could. That's a good point because, you know, you could create conflict in the music of the Einar without, like you say, leading to slavery and murder of created beings there's it's, it's not like a you take one and uh, you have to take everything else it, there could have been conflict um leading to creativity in the music without melkor falling as low as he did because as you say it becomes something completely different and even in um, myths transformed again um it's said that even if he leveled everything into uh, a formless uh, chaos he would still have lost because it still existed and it was something that existed independent of his own mind and would be like a world and potential ready to have creation put into it again. So it's like, it's as if Melkor or Morgoth knows that no matter what he tries, he's still going to be defeated. And I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's in line with um, creating this being who's going to cause a bit of disagreement in the music that seems such an extreme path to take and there's also the the fact that the Valar you know attempt to bring Melkor back into the fold as well 
and if if he wasn't to be a part of them, why would they you know, be commissioned to even do that? Why would they have the authority to do that if the whole plan was that he was to turn to extreme evil? You know, it's uh, I think it just paints Edu in this bad light, and, and that's certainly not what Tolkien would have uh, imagined. I think the idea that some readers view Edu as the one responsible for evil, the, the most evil figure in Legendarium, is completely foreign to what Tolkien was going for and we have to surely respect what he was meaning when he created the figure in the first place. I mean, if we're going to try and understand this metaphysic on Tolkien's terms, we kind of have to accept everything that he tells us about it, regardless of whether or not, you know, we find it convincing. He obviously found it convincing and this, you know, this was the belief that he was operating under when he was trying to piece it together and so just exploring what he meant by that versus what you know, how I might write the story or you might. And then, yeah, I think a couple of points that you mentioned how the Valar are trying to win Melkor back over and gain his cooperation. And especially in the spring of Arda, you get the sense that he's more annoying to them than he is considered like evil. It's like, oh my gosh, really? Like I worked really hard on that mountain range, bro. (laughs) Um, And we see this a couple of points where um, Aule, of course, creates the dwarves, which is like, he should not have done that. He even knew at the time that really I shouldn't be doing that. This is why he does it in secret. And he sees where he goes wrong and he repents. And Eru's like, okay, cool. Now we have dwarves. And that I think on the whole, most people would agree, maybe not Helen, but most people would agree that that turns out to have been a good thing for Middle Earth overall. I mean, dwarves cause problems, but they're cool and we're glad they're around. Mm -hmm. And then even before that with Ulmo and the famous snowflakes example where um, Melkor has had his little discord and I get the feeling that almost kind of pounding in a corner because he had this idea for water and liquidity and everything and Melkor's gone and screwed it all up and Eru comes over to him very gently and says, hey, you know, did you notice that now there's clouds? You know, because of this crazy, extreme, uncontrolled heat and it hit your idea and it changed it and you thought it wrecked it, but no, it just made it, you know, beautiful in a new way. And then almost very happy and he's like, oh, I get to hang out with Manway more because now we're both yeah. like doing air stuff and that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for Melkor trying to be a jerk. Like, thanks, bro. Melkor's like that muttering. That must have really annoyed Melkor. Yeah. Yeah, that <laughs> makes it even worse for him. It's, it, all, it's all beautiful and good, all the corruption that he's putting into the world. Yeah, I think that writ large is potentially, you know, could be a, a less less malevolent but still not entirely benign arc where it's like Melkor causes trouble he doesn't necessarily get so wrapped up in the domination aspect of it as he does he's Mm -hmm. just kind of this low-key trickster figure where he could show up screw things up and it's fun to kind of think about if he had approached Feanor for instance with a little less uh, jealousy and hatred and and covetousness I feel like the two of them in another timeline could have gotten along quite well and done some very interesting things if only they could you know set aside their towering egos so that might be a good place to kind of wrap this up was there any any other points that I've missed any other uh, observations that we should get in here Uh, no because I think there's more we could talk about with Morgoth, but oh, for sure. pro- probably nothing we could talk about in a couple of minutes. We'd have to keep <laughs> talking about him for another hour or two, so we may just have to do a return leg and talk about him again some more. Maybe Feanor and Sauron as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. No, Throwing this is... Saruman too. <laughs> yeah, well, he, yeah, he's, I've recently started to kind of examine him from a more character perspective instead of just an adversary perspective. I'm like, oh man, this guy's got some, this guy needed some therapy before he got <laughs> sent to over here. Yeah. Um, it just got worse from there. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. Definitely more to say we could keep going, but we should probably um, pause now we're, while we're ahead and uh, definitely would be open to revisiting this or taking on another few topics. This has been very enjoyable. The time has gone very quickly. Yeah, too quickly because I wanted to maybe talk about uh, the, like you said, you're talking about Loki there, some examples with uh, Norse and Greek myths as well, um, how Melkor viewed elves and men and um, Ingoliant as well, really interesting figure, but uh, it just means we can do it again, so I'm really happy to do that. Yeah, no shortage of material. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to be on and do some evil chats. Very, I'm very enjoyable. Happy. Very, yeah. uh, very good. Happy uh, to talk about the the evil corrupting forces <laughs> of Middle Earth. That's I'll always accept that invite. 
cheery conversation topic for a yeah. <laughs> lovely May morning or evening, depending yes. on what time zone you're in. Again, just a reminder to people listening, if you have not, for some reason, checked out the Red Book channel or followed him on various social medias, I'll have links in the description. You can check out some of his videos that kind of elaborate, I think, on some of the topics we brought up. And we'll maybe look forward to setting up another conversation in the future. Definitely. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me again. Uh, thank you for being on and uh, see everyone later. A huge thank you to everyone who's supported me on Patreon, especially the top tier supporters, Jared Carver, Rogue Hot Pocket, Joel Beyond, Kevin Gilstead, Karen and Michael Donahue, Luke, Tamara Saldana, Louis Maskell, Frankie Twelve String, Eliana Nor, A. N. Kurtzberg, Elu Thickgol, E. Rose B, Brendan Mooney, John Love, Emperor Kane, and Dorwin Gray. Link will be in the description if you want to check it out.